Statistics and Excel. Correlation random number generation example. Got data? Let's get stuck into it with statistics and Excel. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. You're not required to, but if you have access to OneNote, we're in the icon left hand side, OneNote presentation 1730 correlation random number generation example tab. We're also uploading transcripts to OneNote so that you can go to the view tab, immersive reader tool, change the language if you so choose be able to then either listen to or read the transcript in multiple languages using the timestamps to tie in to the video presentations. OneNote desktop version here thinking about correlation having different data sets to see whether or not there's a mathematical relation or correlation between them. In other words, are the data points and the different data sets moving together in some way, shape or form? If there is a mathematical relation or correlation between the different data sets, the next logical question would be, is there a cause and effect relationship which is causing the correlation or mathematical relation between the different data sets? And if there is a causal relation between the different data sets, the next logical question would be, what's the causal factor and the causal relationship which is causing the correlation or mathematical relation between the different data sets? Now, in prior presentations, we thought about a perfect positive and a perfect negative correlation, which are great to consider in theory, but which are not usually the examples we have in practice, where we don't have a perfect correlation. We usually have uh, some kind of trend. We saw that in another example where we had a very simple trend of only four data points, so we can really analyze the formula that we're putting together in a simple, small, or low data point example. This time we'll have more data points, but we'll actually generate the data points to get a conceptual understanding of how we're generating the data points and then what we might assume would happen therefore with the correlation and then we'll map that out. We'll also take a look at what it means to have randomness to some degree and what randomness kind of looks like as we go through here. So we're just going to imagine we generate in Excel our data, random data one with this formula, random between, and then we're just picking the, the low number, the bottom number one to 100. Excel generating random numbers then between uh, one and 100. We're going to do that two times over. So we then created a second data set, same fashion to do so. And that's going to be the data that we will be using. Now, when we do this in Excel, Excel will keep on regenerating these random numbers. So we're going to imagine that we copy this information over, paste it over here. So now we have static numbers, which will not keep shuffling around that are randomly uh, generated. Now, if I was to just think about how we created those numbers, we can make some assumptions based on what we've done in the past. We could say, well, first I randomly generated numbers not in accordance to a normal distribution or a Poisson distribution or anything like that, but more so towards like a uniform distribution because we had random numbers which could equally come up between a certain interval between zero or one and a hundred. We also know that we generated these two data sets the same way. So they're kind of related in that way. They're gonna be numbers between one and a hundred, but they're not connected in, in any other way in terms of how we created the two data sets. So we might have a hypothesis then that they wouldn't be highly correlated between them, right? Because they're not exactly connected. So we'll, we'll kind of test those out as we go. Now, first I want to look at it pictorially. Let's say we took just this first data set and we, and we made a histogram of it. We counted all of the numbers here and see if they 
how many fall into the buckets of 1 to 18, 18 to 35, and so on and so forth. And, and you can see that it's not a bell curve type of shape or anything like that. It's going to, if we did this indefinitely, it would tend towards a uniform distribution or a, a straight line type of distribution, right? If we did this indefinitely, we would expect kind of an even outcome because they all have kind of an equal chance. Now, if we did this for the second one, same kind of thing. It looks different here uh, because just because of the randomness that happened here, but you would expect the same kind of trend line where it would trend towards a uniform distribution. It's not a bell curve or anything like that. It would tend towards a straight line type of distribution. Now, the fact that these both are kind of similar in nature may give us some understanding about the data sets, but doesn't necessarily mean that they're correlated uh, either. So, so then we're going to do our mathematical calculation. So we'll say, okay, let's do the the mean and the standard deviation for the first data set, which would be the average formula, the average summing up all of the data, dividing by the data points, gives us 48.82. The standard deviation is going to be the standard deviation of a sample this time of the first data set. That's a measure of the spread, 29, 30, uh, 73. I got dyslexic there for a second. If we did that with a mean, summing up all of this stuff and taking the average divided by the units, we get to the 4951. And for the standard deviation, if we took all of this with the standard div dot s, we get 26, uh, uh, 56. Now, these could give us some indication where it's like the mean is similar and the standard deviations are similar. So we might we might kind of start to think, well, maybe they're kind of uh, related in that way. There might, and, and these these look kind of uh, together, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a relation because, again, there is there's not like a direct relationship in the way we created the numbers other than we create them in a similar fashion uh, in terms of the random numbers between a certain interval. So let, let's do our calculations here and say uh, that actually before I do that, let's actually graph this thing out. If I took these two and made a scatter plot of them, graphing them together, it would look something like this. So now we've got the scatter plot. If I was to do this, it would automatically take the first random and make it on the left. I'm sorry, make it the X. So the random one is the X. In this case, I don't really know which should be the independent or dependent. So normally we put the independent factor over here if we know it, but we don't really know what it is. There isn't really one here because we made them completely separately. We just used, in essence, the same technique to make the two data sets. So you can see here that if we plot these together, we get somewhat of a, of a random jumble of of data points, so somewhat of a random jumble. And if we plot the if we plot the curve in there, the trend line, we get a little bit of a so there's a little bit of a correlation, but downward sloping, but not a high correlation. Obviously, you can't really see it if you didn't have the trend line. You, you wouldn't even see a general pattern right here, uh, generally with the dots. Now, if I was to switch the the x and y's then remember, you're still going to get that slight downward sloping. It's not going to change to an upward uh, sloping line. And so now we just changed the the X and the Y's. In this case, we don't we can see the same relation and we don't know which is the independent or dependent factor. Now, just to get an idea of what randomness looks like versus what often people have in their mind of randomness, we did another data set just to kind of show this. Uh, and this one, we actually kind of put a, a system together to create our two data sets. What we did is we just took, we counted by five, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, up to 100 here. And then we did the same thing here, but we staggered it. That's our starting point. I staggered it and we made, we said 5, 10, 15, 20, but we started it like down here. So we, we had the same distances. Uh, and so we had a pattern. And then we made our random number generation on each of these tables and shuffled up the pattern. So now I've got I've got two different uh, sets of numbers that were created with this kind of distancing pattern. I didn't I didn't randomly pick between one and a hundred, but rather we basically had units of five that we put in place and then made a random number generator to kind of shuffle them up. 
and the reason I want to just take a look at that is because that if if we if we then take these two and plot them the numbers that were generated from that process then we get something that looks like this so you can see this is something that is not exactly as random right this is this has you know some randomness to it but this is more like something that that might happen if you were trying to create randomness yourself so if someone said put a random set of numbers but you had to think of them in your mind you would probably space out the numbers so they look something like this so when you see something like this versus something like this this one is often going to be the more random set of numbers because you, you end up with this clumpiness. Like when we think of randomness, we don't think that these clumpy things are gonna happen. But with randomness, it does happen. When we try to do something randomly, we tend to eliminate the clumpiness that happens you know, in randomness. So that's just something to, to keep it to point out here. Now note that when we generated this number, whether they be randomly generated or not, the two data sets that we created are still not correlated because we used the same process again, but we were, we didn't tie them together. So even though it's still not exactly as random as the other set, we still have a very low correlation as indicated by the trend line. Okay, so now let's do our, our calculation to see that mathematically. So this is our z-score of the one uh, times the z-score of the other divided by the n minus one. So if we did that calculation, we can take then the this is our first data set with our random numbers we take the z which is going to be each number minus the mean so in this case it would be 19 minus the mean which is going to be uh in this case minus 48.82 divided by the standard d 29.73 and that's going to be our negative about uh our negative about one and we do that all the way down for all the related items. And we do that for the Y as well. So here's our random data set two. And then here's all of our Z's for it. So that first data point in the data set, 27 minus the mean for the second one, which is 49.51 divided by the standard D 26.56 gives us 84 so we're going to go back on over say okay that's going to give us about 85 and then we multiply the z's together so that we get about one times 0.85 gives us about 85 of course and then this one's going to be the 1.54 times the 1.89 gives us uh hold on a sec k paso the 1.54 times the 1.22 it's going to give us the 1.89 about rounding uh, is involved here. So if we do that all the way down, then that will give us our, our sum. We just need to sum them up to give us the numerator. So we do that over here. We sum them up. We create a little table. The numerator is just going to be the sum of this outer column. The denominator, I'm going to make a subcategory for it by putting n minus one, or you can call it the denominator, colon, do the subcalculation internally, like you might see, you know, like a tax return kind of format, tabbing to show it's a subcalculation, indenting, in other words, 215 is the number of data points. So if we counted all the rows, minus one, and it's, that's gonna give us the denominator, which I'm putting to the outside, double indenting, 214, I now have the numerator and the denominator of our formula numerator denominator on the outer columns of our worksheet and we can divide it out 25.43 divided by the 214 is going to give us the uh, 0.11884 about so that's going to be our correlations fairly low uh, correlation and we can check that with our data analysis which is under the data tab, you have to turn it on. So if you don't have it on, you can go to the options and turn it on, which we show in the worksheet how to do that. When we do this in Excel, you can then pick the, well, you could pick the correlation. This, uh, I picked the, co the correlation right there, and that would give you uh, an input field. 
and then it would spit out, if you pick the correlation, this number we're looking at, this one here, which is comparing the one, the RAND1 and the RAND2 negative 0.11884, which is what we got up top there. So this one is not dynamic though. And remember that you don't get all the, the benefit of kind of looking at these Z scores as you're generating uh, your worksheet. So it's a great tool to have, but uh, it's somewhat limited to just kind of spit out the correlation at the same time. Now, if I did the same thing with the second data set that we made, the second data set, which was less kind of random, and I calculated the Z-score in a similar fashion, and I calculated the Z-score for both of them in a similar fashion. I multiplied the two Z-scores together to get our column over here. And then we did the same correlation calculation, summing up the column to the, to the right, the writer, rightmost column. N minus one or denominator is gonna be the number of, of uh, items, 215 rows. They're not all here, by the way. Well, they might be all here, but I don't think I copied all the rows in our example in OneNote, but they would be in Excel. Minus one, 214, dividing out the numerator and denominator gives us a very a, a lower correlate, 0 .00815. And the, this is the mean and the standard deviation to help us with the calculations of uh, the Z-scores. And then if I did that in Excel to double check it, Excel's given us a similar uh, well, the same, obviously, result here. So the general idea then would be would be that uh, when we're looking at the correlation, you can we here shows randomly generated numbers to get an idea of the correlation. We can come up to kind of a hypothesis of how they would be connected, noting that although we looked at some of the stats that have kind of a lot in common, you know, the mean and the standard deviation are close and they're both have a, uh, a, a tendency that's going to go towards a, a uniform type of distribution doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be, you know, the high uh, correlation between them. And then we mapped out that difference between randomness here and randomness here, which is a good concept to be other to understand, but whether or not your data set is more or less random doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to have an impact on whether or not the two data sets are correlated together moving together in uh, some way shape or form